So good morning. Today we're going to start moving into some more detailed and pertinent discussions on fluid mechanics, starting with a discussion on the nature of fluid flow as it relates to flow regimes and what the implications are for specific flow regimes. So I'm gonna just get a little more organized here. So this discussion will be on flow regimes. So when we're talking about flow regimes, we're really looking at one of the three categories of flow. One being laminar flow. The next being transition flow. And the last one being turbulent flow. Where the flow regime determines the influence of velocity on shear stress and by extension frictional dissipation. And so simply put, we describe flow in terms of one of these three categories to get an idea of what to expect in terms of our mass and energy balances. And what we're really looking at most, most often than not is um, energy loss or frictional dissipation. And the regime of flow that we operate under largely determines what to expect in terms of frictional dissipation. So let's start with looking at that first category of laminar flow. Where laminar flow is considered a low velocity fluid, or it could be a high viscosity fluid, and we'll get to that in a second. with no lateral mixing. Where the fluid layers or streamlines exist independently of one another. And when we're looking at laminar flow, it's important to note that shear stress is a function of fluid viscosity and independent of fluid density. And so when we're looking at those Newtonian fluids, we had the, we would look at the expression that we defined last week, the tau or shear stress is equal to viscosity times the velocity gradient 
within the flow field. Then we're looking at transitional flow. which it's really hard to define what's transitional flow. I'll, I'll give you a crude definition, a moderate flow velocity characterized by the presence of eddies and vortices with some presence of fluid streamlines and it will make sense here in a little bit when I I show you some information beyond in terms of these flows. And the, the important thing in terms of discussing and describing transitional flow is there's no truly effective method to describe shear stress. as a function of fluid properties. Largely because when we're looking at transitional flow, it, it really exists as, as a combination of laminar flow and turbulent flow. And so that the level of irregularity and unreliability um, of flow properties as it relates to shear stress, it just it ends up a little too unpredictable. And so the best you can get when you're looking at transition flow is, is on occasion empirical modeling to describe frictional dissipation. But more often than not, what you're really going to want to look at doing is operating in turbulent flow if you, if you can at all times, and if not, uh, limit to moving into laminar flow. It's extremely rare that you're going to operate in transitional flow, and when you do, there's there's usually an issue there that needs to be addressed. And so I'll say, when it comes to transitional flow, is you know, you almost never operate here, largely due to that unpredictability in the behavior. Because if you if you can't predict what's going to happen, you're you're kind of at the mercy of of, of essentially the the operation itself, and, and you don't have a system that's in under control, and nobody wants that. And the last flow regime that we'll talk about today is turbulent flow, characterized by high vis flow velocities. and low fluid viscosities where shear stress becomes a function of fluid density and exists independent of fluid viscosity. And so it, it kind of equates when you're really looking at the comparison between laminar flow and turbulent flow, you know, think of it as an equation with two terms and in one regime, one term dominates, and then the second regime, the second term dom or dominates. That's a, a form that's used a lot of times when describing fluid mechanics. 
uh, when you're looking at deriving equations to describe fiction and share and things, you basically create a term that describes the laminar portion of flow, a term that describes the turbulent portion of flow, and then you design the expression such that in the laminar regime, that laminar term dominates, and then in the turbulent regime, the turbulent uh, term dominates. So that's, it's a pretty common thing that we see when it comes to fluid mechanics. So just to kind of quick recap, I know I might be going a little fast. So if, if you want me to slow down, just let me know. We're, we're looking at flow regimes where we have laminar transition and turbulent flow. Laminar flow, we consider low velocities with fluids with high viscosity, where we have no real lateral mixing. We have you know, the solid presence of streamlines. And, and these fluid layers can exist almost independently of one another where we have shear stress being a strong function of fluid viscosity and completely independent of fluid density. Then we get into transition flow, which is really a mixture of both laminar and turbulent flow, where you have some you know, presence of fluid streamlines, but a lot uh, also presence of eddies and vortices. There's going to be mixing, and it's going to be both regular and irregular to the point where it's really hard to effectively describe friction and shear stress in this regime. And for that reason, since we can't describe it, we can't predict the behavior, we almost never operate in the transitional flow regime. Now, the turbulent flow regime, we're gonna be looking at you know, high viscosity, flow velocities, and low viscosities, where shear stress starts to become a a function of fluid density, and the dependence on fluid viscosity drops out of the expression. And so we have these three regimes that we like to categorize um, fluid flow under. So the question then becomes, how do we determine which flow regime we are operating under. So how do we identify our flow regime? Any ideas? The Reynolds number. Yes, Walker, thank you. We use a Reynolds number to describe our flow regime. Now, we can define Reynolds number one of many ways. When we're wanting to look at it in terms of the most effective definition, it's a ratio of fluid convective forces over fluid viscous forces. One thing I like to look at when we're, you look at dimensionless numbers like Reynolds is really understanding what each term within a dimension number is describing. And there's one of several ways we can define it. We can define it as density times flow velocity times uh, fluid flow diameter, pipe diameter over absolute viscosity. We can also describe it as flow velocity, flow diameter over kinematic viscosity, which is a, a Greek kappa, which basically equals um, the absolute viscosity over density. We could also describe it as flow diameter, pipe diameter, times a G over mu. This version is very important for gases, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But G is simply equal to density times flow velocity. And it's called a mass velocity. So there's um, a lot of different ways we can calculate it. Um, Definitely the most common way that you'll see it done is rho u d over mu. And now 
we, based on the flow parameters, fluid properties, we can calculate this Reynolds number and from the Reynolds number, we can get an idea of what flow regime we are currently operating under. So with that, we can identify the values of Reynolds number, which correspond to each flow regime. So for laminar flow regime, we consider laminar flow anything with a Reynolds number below 2000. For transition, we consider a Reynolds number between 2000 and 4000. And anything that's turbulent flow is considered any Reynolds number above 4000. Get rid of the equals. One thing I do like to note is that these windows of operation are approximations. And you know they're they're not considered you know rigid set in stone. It's all about fluid stability. But if you're really looking at things in terms of fluid stability, I can I can define these things as having stable streamlines. These are what we would consider unstable streamlines. And these would be essentially no streamlines. It's all about fluid stability within these regimes. And to kind of highlight that, let's see if I can show you this little video, which is a good way of visualizing these, these various regimes. So this is essentially, can you guys see the video okay? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is, here, I'm going to pause it or jump back. You see, this is a essentially fluid being cast within a a pipe and a pipe essentially, and they've got this red fluid that's essentially the same fluid just died. Um, and they're slowly increasing the flow velocity through this large pipe. And this essentially dyed fluid represents a streamline within the flow. And you can see initially that streamline is largely intact. There's, you, you see there's no real mixing going on within that flow. But as they start to increase the flow velocity, the Reynolds number increases. And so what happens when the flow velocity is sufficiently high, uh, the fluid transitions from a laminar flow to a transitional flow. And then you can see there, the fluid streamline starts to break down. It still exists. However, there's definite mixing. There's definite eddy penetration within that streamline. Now, as they continue to increase this flow velocity, even through the transitional flow, we'll start to enter the turbulent flow region. And at that point, the streamline will dramatically break down to the point where it will cease to exist. And we have essentially complete mixing with no solid presence of a fluid streamline. And see right there is where they transition out of transition into a fully turbulent flow regime. So instead of having that nice solid streamline, you usually have essentially a blur of that fluid because it's being mixed sufficiently well within the fluid that it almost ceases to, just, to exist entirely. And that's a good kind of visual representation of transitioning from laminar to transition flow and then transition flow to turbulent flow. 
And like I said, the importance of that is, is the stability of the streamlines and what that means in terms of energy dissipation due to the shear stress within the system. So let's look at an example. Here, you know, I think it'd probably be easier if I just shared my screen. So example one, not so bad on a Monday morning. Determine the Reynolds number of a fluid with a specific gravity of 0.9 traveling through a three inch pipe at a velocity of 1.2 feet per second if the fluid viscosity is approximately 3.46 times 10 to the minus three pound mass per feet second. So let's look at this. We're looking for the Reynolds number, knowing it's the fluid density times the flow velocity times the pipe diameter over the fluid viscosity. So I spent the specific gravity was 0.9. I'm going to assume it's a fluid. So I'm going to use water as my reference, which is 62.4 pound mass per cubic foot. The flow velocity was 1.2 feet per second. The pipe diameter was three inches or three over 12 feet. And the flow viscosity was 3.46 times 10 to the minus three pound mass per feet second. So if we run this calculation, we will find that the Reynolds number, What did you guys get? I'm getting 4,869. All right, so about 4,900 approximately, which based on the choices would be A, and that would be considered turbulent flow. One thing I do want to point out here is more often than not, fluid viscosity is going to be reported in terms of a unit known as a centipoise, primarily because it's based off water. And so one centipoise is often the viscosity of water. you know, at, you know, standard temperature pressure. And one centipoise equals 10 to the minus three Pascal seconds. And it also equals 6.42 times 10 to the minus four pound mass per foot second. So it's, it's something you want to keep in mind. <coughs> Bless you. No, I knew that was wrong. Hold on. It's 6.72. So it's 10 to the minus third Pascal seconds and 6.72 times 10 to the minus four pound mass per feet second. Um, I would just kind of keep this somewhere so that you can kind of go and make those conversions easy because like I said, more often than not, you're going to see centipoise and centipoise isn't going to do a whole lot for you in terms of your calculations. So is there any question on the discussion that we had of Reynolds number, uh, how we categorize those into those flow regimes and how it can be calculated?
All right. Then the next thing I want to touch base on is how we define and describe turbulence and fluid flow. And then we'll finish our discussion today looking at flow boundary layers. So if from that video I just showed you a few seconds ago, one of the things you, you notice is as that fluid breaks down, you start to see high irregularity in the flow due to the presence of eddies and vortices within that fluid. And so since the streamlines start to break down, it becomes very difficult to effectively describe the flow velocity um, if we're looking at a single fluid streamline within the fluid. And what, what you often will see is something that looks like this when we're looking at the actual fluid velocity as it moves in that x direction such that there's no well-defined value that we can effectively rely on due to the unpredictability that exists in both transition and turbulent flow. And since we, we, we have this presence of turbulence, we, we know that there's a high degree of uncertainty and fluid velocity along the flow path. And what we do to, to describe it is, is we, we often define a, an average velocity to allow us to perform our calculations. to predict fluid behavior. And what that means is we, we note that the fluid velocity in any point in the x direction can, can change dramatically. However, over time, we, we find that a stable average flow velocity forms for a number of reasons, mainly when we're looking at mass and energy balances, since those have to hold, those averages can be, be well known. And from those, we can develop approximations to describe flow behavior in terms of both the velocity that we can expect, the frictional a dissipation that will occur, as well as the shear stress that can be exerted uh, by the fluid and as well as by the pipe wall. And when we look at this, this turbulence, we note that it forms due to the presence, or the existence, I should say, of shear stress, which occurs in, in two areas. The largest area is going to be at the solid liquid interface, or simply put, it's, it's going to be where the fluid and pipe wall meet. Because if we're looking at the pipe wall, and we have fluid, here I'll, I'll make the fluid blue. Everybody likes colors. Yeah. <laughs> 
it will flow through this pipe and at the same time it interacts with the pipe wall such that one of several things happens. The first thing that will happen is what we call the formation of a flow boundary layer. And this occurs because if we look at that interface right where the, the wall and the fluid meets, put some fluid here, the velocity of that fluid at this interface is considered zero. What that means is when we're looking at the fluid that's directly interacting with the pipe surface, the, the, the containment surface, we consider that a, a region of zero flow. This is known as a no-slip condition. Because the presence of that, that interface keeps flow from occurring. And what that means is the fluid just above that interface, right? So if this was the y direction, right? At y equals, you know, 0 0.01, the fluid velocity here is very small. And what happens when we have flow that's occurring very slowly? What do we consider that? Call that laminar. We call that laminar flow. And so we have an area here of zero flow right at the interface. And then just above that, we have a second region that we call our laminar boundary layer. Where the velocity of is sufficiently low, close to the fluid solid interface, that that flow exists in the laminar regime. Now, as we move out of that away from the wall, we see that laminar boundary layer giving rise to a second boundary layer, which would be transition. And then finally, I'm running out of colors here, we can have a turbulent boundary layer. And I know this is a little messy. And so jumping back to recap, when we're looking at this solid fluid interface, we have the fluid right next to the wall existing at a zero velocity. Then as we move away from that wall, the velocity will start to increase such that we, we have fluid existing in the laminar regime, then in the transition regime, and then finally within the turbulent regime, assuming that the fluid as, as a whole can be considered turbulent flow. And so we have all three of these boundary layers existing within a system at considered turbulent. And what that means is we have varying different levels of shear stress that occur both within at that fluid solid interface and also among the streamlines that exists within these boundary layers as the fluids flowing past one another. The liquid is going to be exerting shear upon itself. Granted, the shear stress will definitely be at its maxima at that solid fluid interface. Such that if I wanted to graph shear stress, versus the pipe length or pipe diameter. If I had, this was my solid interface, this was my solid interface, and this was kind of the middle. The shear stress would look kind of like this, where we have the maximum shear stress at that interface. And then as you get to the center of the flow, 
the shear stress essentially equates to zero right at the center line. And that's going to be pretty indicative of, of most fluid as it flows. All right. Are there any questions over that discussion in terms of the nature of turbulence and essentially in a lot of ways how it kind of arises due to the existence of these interfaces and the presence of these boundary layers? Right? And, and so what you kind of see is, is you have essentially lots of different fluids flowing at different velocities all within the same kind of slice of flow. And it's these, you know, large variety of flow velocities, which really effectively describes how that turbulence essentially exists. Because that, that sh the shear that exists within the fluid is going to cause the formation of all varying different flow velocities at any given kind of coordinate within the flow system. And so you essentially have all these fluid molecules moving at varying different speeds, which, which causes the, the high irregularity as, as we see as turbulence. And you'll also kind of note from it is if the, the flow velocity was sufficiently small, everything would kind of exist within that laminar boundary layer. Right? If the flow velocity was low and turbulence never formed, it would all essentially exist in, in the laminar regime, which is what we describe as the laminar regime. And, and if everything is laminar and all we, all we have is stable streamlines, we're not going to see turbulence because there's, there's no essentially irregular variation in the flow velocity. All the streamlines are intact, and so they're not going to be largely interacting with one another. And so even though you might have streamlines moving in different velocities, since, they're, since there's going to be no, you know, axial mixing, you're not going to see the turbulence like you see in transition and turbulent flow. And so when you're, you're, what I'm trying to kind of summarize here is that, you know, turbulence largely arises due to these high degree of irregularity that can exist within flow, primarily as a result of shear stress and how it gives rise to these flow boundaries. These flow boundaries cause the flows to, to vary such that a lot of irregularity and turbulence essentially exists in forms. Right, because the fluid really close is moving slow, the fluid far away from the boundary is moving very quickly. And so, you know, by mass and energy balances, you know, a lot of these forces are going to be interacting such that you see a lot of eddies flowing. Because if you have fluid moving really fast in the center of your pipe and fluid moving slower in the edges, you're going to, the momentum's going to want to push things into the center, which causes the formation of these kind of eddy and spiral motions within the fluid. And you don't see that when you're looking at primarily at laminar boundary layers because you know, those, those streamlines stay intact such that you don't have those, the need to form those eddies and vortices within the flow. Neat stuff. It can get complicated quickly, but hopefully you kind of get an idea of of how this turbul turbulence, you know, forms within fluid flow. And so there's a couple ways in which we can quantify the boundary layer. Well, the first way is by calculating the transition from laminar to turbulent flow. And so this is going to discuss the point at which this turbulent boundary layer forms along the leading edge of the pipe. And it's going to be a function of <clears throat> the Reynolds number, as well as the flow velocity, or 
bulk flow velocity, the fluid density, and the fluid viscosity. And the next thing we can look at calculating as well is what we consider the transition length. Which the transition length is essentially the length within a flow section where the boundary layer is considered to fully penetrate the flow field. Which if we're looking at flow through a pipe, the boundary layer is gonna slowly form over time on both sides. And that transition length is, is essentially the, the distance of flow necessary for the boundary layer to be fully developed. I call it X sub T. So X sub T is equal to 0 0.05 Reynolds number times the pipe diameter. So let's look at a couple examples. I think I missed one. Here it is. Estimate the transition length of a 15 millimeter tube where glycerol is flowing at 60 degrees at a velocity of 0.5 meter per second, assuming the density is 1,240 kilograms per cubic meter and the viscosity is 0.022 pascal seconds. So let's take a look at this example. So we have the diameter is 15 millimeters, 15 times 10 to the minus three meters. The density was 1,240 kilograms per cubic meter. Velocity was 0.5 meters per second. And I think we just need the viscosity, which is 0 0.0822 Pascal seconds. So from this, we need the Reynolds number, which is the density times the velocity times the diameter over the viscosity, or 1,240 kilograms per cubic meter times 0.5 meters per second times 15 times 10 to the minus three meters over 0 0.0822 Pascal seconds. Reynolds number then equals, let's see, 1240 times five, I got 113 for my Reynolds numbers. So with that, I can estimate the transition length as 0 0.05 times the Reynolds number times the diameter, or 0 0.05 times 113 times 15 times 10 to the minus three. Actually, I'll just leave it in millimeters, make it easy. And with that, I got 84.9 or about 85 millimeters. Any questions on that example? Anything I can further clarify? No? All right. Let's keep looking at another example. All right, so 
This is an interesting one. Air at three atmospheres and 100 degrees C is flowing at one meter per second in a 1.5 centimeter tube. If it is estimated that the flow is laminar but nearing turbulent flow or transition flow, which of the following would cause the flow to become turbulent? Increasing the temperature, increasing the tube size, or increasing the air pressure. So, so this is a, a multiple choice. I want to give you guys a, a minute to think about it. Then we'll play everybody's favorite game. Rock, paper, scissor. Where A was temperature. B was pipe diameter. And C was pressure. So it's so going to be pressure, diameter to increase or cause it to go from laminar to turbulent. So if you think it's A, you can do rock, B can be paper, C can be scissors. All right, I already got some scissors, papers, papers, scissors. All right. Nobody likes rock. Everybody's anti-rock today. So papers and scissors seems to be, well, the correct answer for this one is actually, it depends. Meaning that there are some instances where both increasing the temperature, pressure, and or diameter can increase your Reynolds number and, and change the nature of turbulence as it exists within the fluid flow. So let's wrap up today by taking a closer look at this. So. We, we discussed that we define Reynolds, which can effectively describe the turbulence that we expect to see, as well as the flow regime the fluid's going to operate under. If we increase the temperature, that's going to largely do two things for us when we're looking at a gas. One is the viscosity will decrease because the higher the temperature, the lower the viscosity. Now, the dependence of temperature on viscosity may, may be unknown, but in general, the, the viscosity is going to go down. So the Reynolds number may increase. But at the same time, if we look at density, which is PM over RT, increasing the temperature will decrease the density. And so, you know, based on those grounds, you can argue, well, it's going to be really hard to determine what the Reynolds number is going to do and, and flow is going to do as a function of temperature which I'm guessing is why a lot of people didn't say a whole lot about rock in this case. Pipe diameter is, is a very solid argument there, right? If we're looking at Reynolds number and pipe diameter, there it is. So if I increase the pipe diameter, the Reynolds number should increase, primarily because you have a larger field of fl flow. So, you know, that's a solid choice, solid choice. If, if up here was, was, a, was a six out of 10, I would say this is, this is a 10 out of 10. Pressure is gonna do a couple things, right? If we're looking at the expression again, the density will increase for sure. But it's, it's gonna be a little hard to, to describe what, what's gonna happen with, with the fluid viscosity. Large of the times that's not, um, 
going to be really influenced by pressure. So this is also a good choice. So I, I would give this one an 8 out of 10. So in terms of direct answer, probably paper would be the, but at the same time, pressure is also a valid choice. So I know nobody likes that. I gave you a multiple choice and there's more than one technically valid answer response. Well, that's all I have for today in our discussion on flow regimes, starting to touch base on turbulence, shear stress. These, these things that we've talked about today will definitely become um, into greater prominence as we get into mass and energy balances um, Wednesday and Friday. So are there any burning questions? Anything I can assist with? If not, thank you all for attending today's lecture. Um, as always, if you need anything, feel free to reach out via email, come by my office hours, and if not, I will see you all on Wednesday. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Are we Thank you. Going? Thank you. Are we gonna go through like um, flow around elbows and stuff, like pipe geometries? Yeah, we'll, t we'll touch base on those. Okay. I'll hold off till then. I was yeah, just curious. You're fine. No. Yep. Thank you. Of course. Hey, Dr. Lopez. Yes. Uh, I have a question. I, I think I'm getting a little, maybe a little confused by your units when you do the English units. Okay. Um, I thought that I remembered that the 62.4 number, I thought that was the specific weight of water, but I guess maybe you're, you're using it as density. So I thought the way that worked was if you said the density is is around 1.94 slope per foot cubed, and then you multiply that by the gravity, that would give you the 62.4 number. But now I'm, I'm kind of confused because I see you're using it as density. Can you tell me where I'm, I guess, misunderstanding that? Well, that's the, that's the reference density of water, which, it's, which is gonna be 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter or 62.4 pound mass per cubic feet at you know, standard temperatures, you know, about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, one atmosphere. Okay, so if you're using the 62.4 number, you don't have to multiply by gravity again, or you do? Like if um, you're looking for hydrostatic pressure. Well, if you're looking for pressure, then yeah, you're going to have to multiply by gravity as well as divide by G sub C. That's why, like I said, it's the, the, the units really matter because, you know, that's, that's in pound mass, not in pound of force. So you when multiply by gravity and then divide by GC. Mm-hmm. Okay, so but, but aren't those two, I guess, values basically the same in English? Yes. Units? Yes. Okay, that makes sense. I'll it's just really a matter confused. of keeping track of them to make sure that things don't go awry. Okay, yeah. so, so that's why is, the, the mass and the weight are the same in English units. Gotcha. That's, that's what had me confused. So, pound mass is basically not the same as slugs. That's a different thing. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you for clearing that up. I was getting a little confused. Oh, no problem. Take care. Thanks, Dr. Lopez. Of course.